Kendra. If you're excited that your kids are back in school, say amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Oh, what an honor. What a joy. I'm so excited for that. I just want to take a moment before we uh, get started with the message that God's laid upon my heart. If you are an educator in that of the public, private, or homeschool realm, would you just slip up your hand in this room? I want everybody to get a chance to see how many we have in this room that are educators. Isn't that a blessing? We've got those who are, yeah, let's give them an amen. Thank you. <laughs> to instill Christ-like joy in the hearts of young children and even older children. So thank you for your service for that. What a joy to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. What a joy to serve the Lord uh, this morning. I know I got to say goodbye to Dave Iannacone, our administrative admissions pastor, and Penny this morning as they made their way out to go drive the golf carts. Uh, and so uh, I, I told Dave, he's like, I want to serve. He said, here's the time slot they need. It's during the service. I said, you need to go. You need to serve. And that's what we need to do is to continue to share the love of Christ. And anyway, sometimes it's, it's a bad time of scheduling, but sometimes that's exactly what's needed. I want to tell you a little about what they're doing this morning and what we've been doing throughout the weekend over at the Festival of the Little Hills. So we've been driving golf carts. I got to drive on Friday night. I got to re relieve Marvin Scott. And uh, so what we did was we drove around and we got to hand out uh, anybody that wanted one because we're not allowed to take donations. It's all free. But we said we can give you something. And so we wanted to give them something. And so we were giving them some hand sanitizer from our church. It says ridgecrest.org on it. And uh, so we said, hey, listen, we'd love for you to take this and have this. And we, we're just volunteers out here showing the love of Christ. And uh, we'd love for you to come if you have an opportunity to come to our church. And so that's what we were doing in our community. Just a great way of getting our names out there. And so what a blessing it is that we were able to do that. And that there's some doing it right now, as well as in the afternoon. We've got more that are doing it. So please continue to be in prayer for them. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. We launched into this series a couple weeks ago. We dove into who wrote it. It was Simon Peter the Apostle. Uh, we wrote, found out who he's writing it to, the audience of believers, that is the elect believers who were scattered abroad. And that time it was Asia Minor. And he wrote it around AD 62-64, right before the persecution of Nero took place. And he wrote it from Rome. And then we talked a little bit about the purpose in week one. And we dove into the understanding that he really wrote this to encourage the believers to live holy lives in the midst of the unholy lands that they were currently residing in. We talked a little bit about this for our perspective. Uh, and that America is becoming increasingly more anti-Christian. And so we are beginning to see more and more persecution. There's a lot more persecution, of course, around the world uh, for Christians. But, of course, we don't see too much of that. But yet, we still need to be encouraged to know that God's got everything under control. He knows everything, and he can be there to strengthen us in the midst of the times that we struggle through in this world. And that's what we looked at in week one. We talked about that in week two, which was last week. We dove into 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. We spent a little bit of time to learn about how we can have hope in the midst of the trials that we go through. And a part of that, we can understand that we can have joy in the midst of the fact that Jesus Christ, at his revelation, that he is coming back. There's joy in that. There is a great uh, blessing we have in the midst of hoping in him. And then finally, we talked last week about how we can have peace. We have peace because we know that we are worshiping the one true God of this universe. And his word makes it abundantly clear of that. Well, today we want to talk about how we can live holy lives in the midst of an unholy land that we are residing in. And how do we do that? Well, I believe we do that by obediently following our Father. To obediently follow the Father is our goal. thought about during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln met with a group of ministers for a prayer breakfast. Lincoln was not a churchgoer, but a man of deep, if at times, unorthodox faith. At one point, the minister said, Mr. President, let us pray that God is on our side. Abraham Lincoln responded to the minister, and he said this. He said, no, gentlemen, let us pray that we are on God's side. Lincoln reminded those ministers that religion is not a tool by which we use God to really do what we want to do in our lives, but yet it's an invitation to open ourselves up to being and doing what God wants us to do. The correct, really true statement would be this, is we obediently follow God, not God obediently follows us. And so we seek to live obedient lives for our Father. If you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25 this morning, a little lengthier text. It'll be on the screen for you this morning. 
The Word of God says this, Peter said, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. And he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 22 then says it this way, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. We're talking about obediently following the Father. How can we do that? Well, Peter makes it abundantly clear to those uh, during that time period who were scattered throughout Asia Minor. He said this, to prepare your minds. And this morning, I believe we can do that, to be obediently follow the Father, to prepare our minds. He starts off in verse 13 and says, Therefore, in other words, because of the salvation that has been prophesied about and that has been given to those who express faith in Jesus Christ, we're called to do something. We're called to action. If you think about it this way, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, that entire set of verses really was Peter describing in great detail how the believer in Christ has an eternal inheritance and that really it only comes from God. But then Peter shifts his kind of tone, if you will, of giving a description of how God moves to now moving into commanding believers to action. And so God's word here emphasizing our call as followers of Christ to understand that with the salvation that we have been entrusted with, we have great responsibility. Uncle Ben said it best to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. It's a great quote. I thought about it this way. With the salvation that we've been entrusted with, we've been given power by God Almighty. And so we serve him faithfully, responsibly, obediently. You know, serving Christ and obeying what he's called us to do is not a bad thing. And oftentimes people think that having rules to follow is a bad thing. It's a negative thing. Well, I don't believe so. I can remember growing up as a child and my mom once told me, Neil, don't play in traffic. It's a good statement, right? Of course, my brother and I found every way to try to play in traffic that we weren't actually playing in traffic. We once took footballs and threw them over the vehicles as they were driving. That is not a great idea, by the way. Uh, we got a lot, a lot of trouble for that, but not that I'm bitter about any of that. But she also told me some rules like don't touch the stove when it's hot. There's some rules that are good to follow, and it keeps us safe, keeps us okay. Well, the same thing is true. It's for our benefit. It's for our well-being that we have rules, and that God blesses us with things like that to keep us safe. You know, it's for our good, and it's for his glory that we obediently follow his word. But Peter's first command here is this. If you notice this, he says that you are to be actively preparing your minds for action. The word preparing in the Greek literally means to gird up. During Roman times, the people would take their garments and they would wrap themselves with their garments around so that they would be able to move freely. This process was called girding. In other words, Peter really wanted the believers to understand that they needed to prepare themselves. They needed to get ready in their minds for what was coming, that this was going to be a long journey. And that it is of the Christian life. It is a long journey filled with great times and filled with rough times. And so he wanted to prepare them. Today, I believe we could have the same encouragement to be prepared in our minds for what's to come. Well, how do we do that this morning? And how did Peter encourage them? Well, he gave them a couple things found in this passage in order to prepare their minds. Look at the first thing as he says in verse 13. He says, being sober-minded. 
In other words, to keep sober in the spirit would be a better translation of that. This is a call to embrace sound judgment in all areas of our lives. Our minds must be fixated, in other words, on what God desires. We focus on what God says and say, God, help me to live the way that you've called me to live. But we can only live soberly lives if we keep our minds focused on his word. Well, how can we also do that? Well, by the second thing in verse 13, he tells them, he says, to fix your hope on God's grace. Verse 13, he continues, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, we can only succeed in our journey as believers when we set our hope on the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. You know, last week we talked about the fact that the world has a dying hope, but we as believers have a living hope. And his name is Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead. Amen? And we think about that as he is risen and that we are waiting one day for his return. And that's what he's talking about here at the revelation of Jesus Christ, his second coming, that he will return. The word of God reminds us that our hope does not rest in this life, but in the life to come. Paul once told the church at Corinth this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. He said, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Believers, we don't have a hope in the things in this world. We have a hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope, our faith is in the eternal life that is granted from God for those who believe and it is secure in his capable hands. Thought about what Jesus told those and John quoted this in his gospel in John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hands. Jesus, of course, was talking about the never perish. In other words, that of that of the second death that he refers to in Revelation. That of being eternally separated from God. In other words, Jesus says this. Those who follow me, those who are obedient to me, those who have put their faith and trust in me, they are secure for all eternity. And that we are. Amen. We need to prepare our minds for what's to come. But also, I believe in this text, we need to examine our conduct. Look at verses 14 and following. In verse 14, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former passions in your ignorance. And as we obediently follow Jesus Christ, we realize our call not to be conformed to the passions in the past that we were ignorant of, that it affected us in our relationship with God. Paul gave an exhaustive list of the former passions to the Galatians. Here's his list in Galatians 5, 19-21. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality, idolatry and sorcery and enmity and strife, jealousy and fits of anger, rivalries and dissensions and division, divisions, envy and drunkenness and orgies and things like these. And I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's the things of the flesh, the things of the past, the former things we did in our ignorance not understanding how it affected our relationship with the Most High God. You know, before we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we were ignorant of a lot of sinful things that we've done in our actions and our attitude. But after we profess faith in Jesus Christ, something happens. The Holy Spirit then comes in and guides us into an understanding of how awful those sinful things really are. Praise God for the Holy Spirit that convicts us, that guides us, that strengthens us to remember that that was the former way in which we used to live. But God desires to, for us to live differently. Well, how is that? What is that? Well, here's how he wants us to live differently. Look at verse 15. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You know, God is perfect. He is holy. The word holy is the word hagios here in the Greek, and it's used to portray a couple different things in the Bible, in the New Testament even. So let's look at a couple ways it's used, and I'll kind of reveal what Peter is using it in in each of the ways that he kind of addresses this morning. The first is really reverence to God. Mary said it best in Luke chapter 1, verse 49. She said, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. We worship a holy God this morning. Amen? And we desire to give him reverence, to give him praise, to give him honor for who he is and his holiness. Like in the beginning of verse 15, this is what Peter proclaimed. He said, the one who called you is holy. 
It's talking about God, the one who called us is a holy God. And he's worthy of all of the honor that is due his name. Second phrase or second way that this is often used in the word holy in the New Testament is to be set apart for God. And so it would be really putting it as somebody who is exclusively his. Paul addressed the believers at Rome, and he said this in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. That's the word holy there. Those who are called to be his. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the next chapter, Peter's going to dive a little bit more into this concept of what holiness looks like and being a part of God's called holy group. And he says this in 1 Peter 2, 9, at the very beginning, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Catch this part too. A people for his own possession. As believers in Christ, we are set apart as the people for God's own possession. Like those to whom Peter was talking about and writing to, of course, in the very first part of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, those elect exiles, believers in Jesus Christ. Well, what about the third way that this is, word is often used? And it's used a bunch here in the text that we're about to look at in this verse and the verses to come. It's the word for pure. That of being sinless, that of being upright or holy in a moral sense. In other words, God desires that his followers strive to live morally pure lives. This is to what Peter was referring to at the end of verse 15 and the verses that follow. Leaving the fleshly desires behind, we pursue godly, spirit-filled desires that lead to that of what would be considered holy, pure, righteous. Paul gave that listing of what that would look like in Galatians chapter 5 as well. And here's that, what that would be in verses 22 through 25 to the Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Remember what Peter is talking about. The former things in their ignorance. It's in the past. We've crucified these things. And if we live by the Spirit, in verse 25 of Galatians chapter 5, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. We live, we have the Spirit guiding us, directing us, and helping us, and encouraging us to be strong and to be holy. And that's what Peter says here in verse 16. And he says, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now this verse is quoted, of course, first appeared in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. I'll explain what was happening when it was first used. God was really using it to warn Moses and the people to keep themselves pure by abstaining from certain things that would make them unclean. Specifically, God in that passage in Leviticus chapter 11 told the people to stay away from things that they should not eat, things that would defile their body and make them unpure or, unpure or unclean that would be really not good for them in the way of who they were supposed to be. It was not beneficial for them. Like, for instance, let me give you a list of some of those in Leviticus chapter 11, 29 through 30. This is what he said, stay away from and don't eat. Here's a picture of them, the mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard, and the gecko. That's some good advice not to eat that, amen? And so we don't eat those things. That mole rat, by the way, if you want to blow up that picture at your home, that is a scary looking critter. And he's like, don't eat these things because they make you unclean. Now, is that what Peter's referring to here to the people? of Saying, hey, don't eat of specific things that are going to make you unclean to be holy. I don't believe so. I don't believe that's what the text is alluding to. The next occurrence that we have of this statement jumps into Leviticus chapter 19. And listen to verses 1 through 4. As the Lord spoke to Moses, he said this, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. You shall keep his Sabbaths. And I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. In other words, what he was saying to Moses and to the people is, in order to be holy, you need to follow my commandments. If you fast forward to the time when Peter was writing the elect exiles who were scattered throughout Asia Minor, his audience knew that this was most likely the issue that he was talking about, not about eating specific foods where they were located, but talking about the desire to continue to follow his commands. Fast forward to our time period, 2,000 years later, nothing has changed. Listen to 1 John 5, 3. 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We desire to follow the commands of the Lord, to know that it's not a burden to say, let me look at my conduct and see, God, what you called me to do and help me to live my life for you. His commandments keep us from doing wrong. So it's a good thing to take a look at them. And he continues on in verse 17. Look what he says. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Those who call on their father understand that they subject themselves to his will and to his way. And so the child humbly conducts themselves with fear. That's what fear is the word phobos. It's where we get our word phobia or fear. It's dread or terror or even reverence. In other words, this fear or reverence, I believe, is not over those who would mistreat the ex, these exiled elect believers where they were living. But I believe the fear was directed to their father who judges us according to our deeds. Now, we don't have to be afraid of this to have a, have a fear that we're afraid of the judgment to come because we know that God is taking care of everything. You know, I'm reminded of the story of the king and the criminal. There was once a criminal who had committed a crime, and he was sent to the king for punishment. The king told him he had two choices for his punishment. One is he could be hung by a rope. The other is he could take what is behind the big, dark, scary, mysterious iron door. The criminal quickly decided on the rope. And as the nooses slipped on him, he turned to the king and asked, By the way, out of curiosity, what's behind the door? The king laughed and said, You know, it's funny. I offer everyone the same choice, and nearly everyone picks the rope. And so said the criminal, Well, tell me, what's behind the door? I mean, obviously, I won't tell anyone. And he said, pointing to the noose around his neck. The king paused and then answered, It's freedom. But it seems most people are so afraid of the unknown that they immediately take the rope. And I think in our lives, sometimes we're afraid of what's to come and the fear of judgment to come, but we have no need because of what Christ has done for us. He's taken away our sin. He's cleansed us from it so we can be pure. And we don't suffer from the unknown. The Word of God tells us what happens and what's going to happen. Peter even continues and says what's happened. He says, knowing that you were ransomed in, in verse 18 from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Peter was not holding back any punches here. He was proclaiming the fact that we as believers in Christ have been freed from a useless and worthless existence. That's what he's explaining here in this text. John MacArthur even said it best about this. He said, even the grandest accomplishments unbelievers seem to achieve are pointless from eternity's perspective. Jesus talked about this early on in his ministry. This is what he said in Matthew 16, 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and yet forfeits his soul. You know, it doesn't matter how much we amass in this world, but it matters what we accept. To accept the free gift that God offers of that of salvation in himself. And Peter knew that well, and he tried to explain that to the believers, that they were ransomed from the feudal things that didn't matter. The things that were the religious, really, principles that a lot of people followed that were traditions as opposed to following a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he was pushing. And that it doesn't fade away. And that it's forevermore. And that cleansing comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to Hebrews 9, 12. It tells us that Jesus, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. Thus securing an eternal redemption. That's exactly what he did for us. He died for us. So that we could live lives that are holy for him. Ridgecrest, as we examine our conduct, we remember that we will make mistakes. We're not perfect, and we recognize that. We've all fallen short of God and His glory. We've sinned. But we remember that once we've sinned, God can cleanse us of that sin, and He has because of His precious blood on the cross. We are forgiven. We are forgiven greatly. Verse 20, he continued and said, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This is Jesus Christ, but was made manifest in your times. He became flesh and dwelt among men, John talks about. Who through him are believers in God. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Jesus Christ 
came before the foundation of the world we know, created the world, was a part of the world, became manifest in the flesh. We can live through him. He died for us and rose victorious so that we could have faith and hope in God. And we do just that today. But we examine our conduct and we see here the life of Christ and what he lived, that holy life of striving to be pure and blameless. Our call is to do the same. We prepare our minds. We examine our hearts and our conduct. And lastly, this morning, verses 22 through 25, I believe this to be true. We need to purify our hearts. It starts off in verse 22, having purified your souls. That word purified here is a perfect participle that describes something. It describes a past action with continuing results in the present. In other words, God cleanses Christians of their impure past, but also gives them the assurance that their souls are continually being purified in the present as well as the future to come. Jesus died so that we might have that full cleansing in the past, in the present, and in the future. And that purification comes not from our own doing, but it comes completely by the sovereign act of God Almighty. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, when God draws and we have to give an answer and an account for it. Verse 22, Peter then said it this way, By your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You know, as we can completely and obediently follow Christ, we naturally will have a sincere love for each other. And that's going to come from a pure heart, the pure heart that is focused not on our inward gain, but our really outwardly what we can do for others. And we've seen this a lot through our super summer of service and the things that we've got to really take part in together as a body of believers and also some of those things that we've done outside of the church to serve people, to show the love of Christ in practical, tangible ways and to continue to do that. And we desire to do just that, to continue to be obedient to him, to show love to others from a pure heart. But we are also blessed by what Christ has done for us. If you think about it, look at verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. You know, we've been born again. Peter here uses the perfect tense to this participle to emphasize this. The new birth occurred in the past, but it has continual effects in the present and in the future to come. We've been born again. Many in here have been born again years ago. So maybe recently. Some many, many, many moons ago have accepted Christ. We've all been blessed by that, of that event in the past. Some may not have that event in the past today, but today could be that event where you say, God, I want a relationship with you. I put my faith and trust in you. I want to be born again. But to them, he was referring to it, you have been. It's been in the past, but it continues its salvific work in the present. That God continually moves in you. This occurs by the imperishable seed. What he's referring to here in the text is that of what everlasting life is. In other words, it's not going to fade away. To our salvation, it has no end. This has been granted through the very word of God. John, even when he was wrapping up his, one of his letters in 1 John 5.13, said it this way, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's a blessing this morning to know that we have eternal life. Amen? Well, the word of God is clear. Who believes and puts their sincere faith in God, those possess eternal life that he grants. And then he talks about it this way. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of God is different than the flesh. The word of God remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This great news that we have has been preached to us even this morning. That the word of the Lord remains forever, it will endure forever. That the good news of salvation, that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he lived that holy life, and he died for us on the cross, and three days later he rose victorious of the grave. That's good news this morning, amen? And that's exactly what was preached to those during that time period. Here's salvation. It's by the precious blood of Jesus Christ that we get to celebrate here in just a few moments. Let's pray.